Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you could go ahead and start turning there. I'm going to start off talking about the definition for what a reference point actually is. So I like dictionaries. When I was growing up, there was the famous Webster's Dictionary, and now it is Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, and it's two different words. It's not Merriam and Web it's, yeah, Merriam and Webster. Anyway, they combined them together. Re Merriam-Webster's Dictionary calls a reference point something that is used to judge or to understand something else. So reference points are kind of like similar to labels or stereotypes in a certain way, but in another way, they're completely different. A reference point is something that we use to understand something that we're unfamiliar with. It's also used to, to, as something that we use to judge our standing or our position in relation to something else. So in this case, what we're talking about here, we're talking about new creation, and we're going to be talking about the way that we judge ourselves or the way that we are judged by others, the way that we are seen by others, the way that we are la the labels that may be put on us by other people in our lives. Anybody in this room ever been called stupid, fat, ugly, mean, nasty, jerk, fool, any of those kinds of things? There's probably a few other names and a few other labels that have been applied to you sitting in the room here that I'm not going to say from the pulpit. I'm not going to say from up here, but you can use your imagination and, and, apply and, and think about some of those names and some of those labels. You can think about stereotypes. A stereotype is when somebody's reference point is set or fixed, and they have this belief that this type of person is going to act this way, do this certain thing, talk this way, or be that way because of their experience with somebody else. Somebody else that may have said something, you know, it, usually it's something as arbitrary as the way somebody looks. Stereotypes are a lot of times applied because of the way that people look or the way that they appear to other people. And so you have judgments against you based on this stereotype before somebody actually knows you or knows you as a person. It's all about the way that you appear to be in their eyes and their previous experience or the experience that they were told. And they say, that person must be just like this because they look, sound, or act like that. Right? Okay. So today we're talking about the difference or changing that dynamic. And we're going to be talking about, about ourselves in particular because the first, when change is going to happen in your life, the first person it always happens with is with me or you. So let's start reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, how many people here in this room, pastor asks this all the time, and I usually try not to do it because it's like this, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. You know, I, I'm like, okay, okay, my shirt's getting untucked, and I'm standing. No. Um, but how many in this room will say that you're a Christian and or you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Something along those kinds of lines. So this is what this is talking about. We're changing reference points. Old reference point is going to be for the natural man, for the person that you were before you accepted Jesus as your Savior or before you made a change in your life or before you did something else. Man in his natural state is separated from God. His spirit has been separated because of sin. But when you accept Jesus, he begins to see you as something completely different from the way that you were before. This does not mean that your family, your friends, the people that you talk to, the people that you hang around with, the people that you go to work with are going to see you different. 
Not at first. You tell, oh, I got saved. They don't know what that means. They don't care. They're going to look at you exactly the same way that they, that, that, and they say, you're the same person that you've always been. Sometimes you'll hear, oh, you've got a little light shining now. You're, you're glowing. You look happy. But not all the time are you going to hear that because people say people can't change. And they're going to be the same person that they've always been. The same person that I went to high school with is the same person that's going to die 60 years later, and I'm going to see them, think of them, and consider them in the same reference point for the rest of their life because I know them. Mm. That sounds like a judgment. But that's knowing people according to a label, according to a stereotype, according to, but it's not giving any account for a person to be able to change or grow or adjust things or become a different person in their entire life. I promise you that every single person sitting in this room has changed from when they were born. There isn't anybody sitting here that could feed themselves, change their own diapers, wash their own clothes, walk to the bathroom on their, or anything else like that on the day that they were born. You couldn't speak. You couldn't count. You didn't know the alphabet. You couldn't read. Amen. So every single person in here has learned, grown, and changed. Problem is, is that once we think that we get to know ourselves or know somebody, we stop making allowance for somebody to change or to grow or to improve themselves. And we want to keep them in the same box, in the same space, and the same everything. But a lot of times we do that to ourselves also. And we see ourselves as the same person as when we were born, the same natural man. I'm always going to be angry. I'm always going to be quick to respond. I'm always going to be grouchy when I haven't slept long, you know, or I'm always going to be this, or I'm always going to be that. Maybe you've been told by others you're always going to be this or that, but you're re that's the reference point of knowing somebody in the natural and not making allowance for them to be able to change. Let's, let's read one, another scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'll start reading in verse 12. And it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. This means that we didn't know these things before we came to know God. Verse 13, it says, these things that we're speaking of right now, we talk about not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. So, because man uses, but the, all right, let me keep reading. But which the Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things to spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So what this is telling us is that when our spirits are dead or they haven't been reconnected to God, or they haven't been quickened, they haven't been made alive, they haven't been made the new creature that we read about in the first scripture, that understanding spiritual things can be difficult. Nobody starts in coming in understanding spiritual things. You start coming to church, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't understand what all of this means. What in the world are you talking about? What we're talking about right now is that there is a change from the person when you were born to the person that you become when you're connected with God. People see you as being ignorant, stupid, foolish, lazy, mean, you know, this, that, or whatever. God sees you as being not connected to him, kind of like this man here with the lights off. But when you accept Jesus, when you accept salvation, when you accept the Lord, something changes on the inside immediately, and God sees you as a completely new and different person, all lit up from the inside because you've been reconnected with your creator. Your spirit has been reconnected with your creator. People may see you as the same person. They may think about you as the same person. They may talk about you as the same person. You may act 
exactly the same way. But God doesn't see you like that anymore. God sees you as an entirely new person, a blank canvas, a place to start over from the beginning and correct mistakes from the past, a place place to grow from, a place to change. You are now his child reconnected to him in the way that he willed and intended for per, uh, with purpose from when you were, from when he created mankind different so our understanding about ourselves and about each other also has to change and adjust there's a process for this and i'm going to read you one out of out of second peter here in just a minute and so this is one process that kind that I'm going to go through. I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to slow it down, and then I'm going to go step by step a little bit. This is not the only process for spiritual growth that there is. This is an example that was laid out by the Apostle Peter. You can kind of see, if you go back to the Gospels and read the, the Gospel accounts, of Peter and how Jesus called him out of being a fisherman and out of his boat to come and follow him and work with him and everything. And you could see how some of these things changed in Peter himself, which is probably where he got this step-by-step thing because it was his own experience that brought this understanding and this change in reference point in viewing and talking about and discussing about himself. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'll start reading from there. So I'm going to read a few scriptures, then I'm going to go back and talk about them, and then I'm going to read a few more, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us great and exceeding precious promises that by these you might be partakers of this divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, the corruption that came into the world because, was because of man's lust for power. It was for man's lust to be equal with God. It was for man's lust to be better than their fellows and to be uh, over top of them. But what we're talking about here is Peter starts off by saying grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge that comes from knowing God and from knowing Jesus. What grace and peace? How many people here at some point in your life, maybe still right now, have faced worry, anxiety, pain, uh, judge, self-doubt, judgment against yourself, let, being labeled or stereotyped by others, and it brings about bad thoughts, bad feelings, bad, you know, uh, bad self, low self-esteem. Bad feelings about you, sometimes bad feelings about others. But as we're learning this process and and our reference point is changing, we begin to know God doesn't think about us the same way that we think about ourselves or the same way that other people talk about us. God thinks about us in a completely different way and in a much better way. And as we, if we can learn to begin to accept God's perspective about ourselves instead of the perspective of everybody else or the way that we think about ourselves when we look in the mirror, then we can start improving our self-esteem and the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we act and the way that we behave doing things. But this comes through the grace and the knowledge as we learn new things. Okay, so let's read about this process of knowledge because learning is a process. You can sit down in school and read a book or or at your home or wherever you are and you can read a book, you can watch a YouTube video, you can look something up online 
and get a step-by-step -step process on how to bake cookies or how to do it yourself, home repairs or how to do anything else. But that knowledge doesn't automatically equal understanding because it's through experience that the knowledge begins to develop into an understanding. You begin to get an understanding for the process as you do something for the first time, not just read about it. You can start getting an understanding, but until you actually start doing something, the understanding is only going to increase to a certain point. As, the exper as you experience something and do something, then you find out ways that you could have done it better. And then the wisdom comes to know the next time that you're going to paint a wall, fix a fence, cook a Thanksgiving dinner, or do something else, your knowledge and understanding and experience all add together, and then you're able to make better decisions, better choices with more wisdom, and you become more efficient and do all of these things. So this process that we're talking about that I'm going to read to you here from, from Peter is a place to start. People start coming to church and they think, oh, I'm supposed to be holy and godly and, I'm, and, and, and live like this. I talk to people all the time. We talk in, in Bible school classes. I ask them, how many of you have history with church prior to coming to this one? And in how many of those churches did they have to measure your godliness before they accepted you into the church or because, before they would accept you, your, your claim of salvation? They would say, oh, we have to sit you down with a group of people and we have to sit there and we have, and we have to say, do you act like this? Do you still do this? Do you, how do you handle these types of situations? How long have you been saved? You know, how, you, know you have to go through uh, long periods of repentance with witnesses uh, until they determine whether or not you're actually meaning you're with it, when you're repenting for sins or for something like that before they're going to accept you. That's because that was what, was ha what happened to them 40 years ago, and they think that you have to go through the pain, suffering, and foolishness of, of somebody else the same way that they did, or otherwise it's just not going to mean anything. I see you smiling with bemused looks on your faces, but, you know, because you all know what I'm talking about. And you go in and somebody says, you're not really saved because if you were saved, you wouldn't dress like that. You're not really saved because if you were saved, you wouldn't talk like that. You weren't, you're not really saved because if you were saved, you wouldn't think like that, act like, you know, do this or do that. And it's all based on their own perceptions and almost never based upon what the Bible actually says. The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's, that's about as easy as it can get because God doesn't want you to suffer and God doesn't want you to be in pain and God doesn't want you to have to do all of these things. It's men that want you to have to, to jump through all of those hoops. So this process that we're going to be talking about that I'm going to read to you is a process of spiritual growth. It's not the only way that it can be done but it shows that step by step, you're not meant, you, you're not created when you get this, when you get saved, this new creation isn't perfect right off the bat. It's perfect in God's eyes. The new man is completely perfect in God's eyes, but that doesn't mean that our behaviors, our lifestyle and choices, the ways that we do things are all of a sudden completely improved or whatever, because nobody's perfect. Our life is a continued process of growth. So let's, let's review this one process of imp this one improvement process and see what it says. And this is second Peter chapter one, verse five. It says, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now what, so you start off with faith. Faith is believing that there's something and faith in God well, faith is just believing something but when we're talking about faith in God faith to salvation that part that faith is that you believe that there's something bigger than you that exists and your hope is that put by placing your face in faith in this thing that's bigger than you that if things when things are really bad in your life or that that 
somebody can help you. Something that is bigger than you can help you. And as your faith begins to grow, you begin to realize that you don't have to wait for an emergency. You don't have to wait until things are really bad because those exceeding great and precious promises that we talked about just a few minutes ago belong to us all the time. So then you can start to believe, well, God really does want the best for me, but I have to do my part to make the right choices to make sure that his promises are working in my life. But faith starts off really simple. I believe that God is bigger than me and that God can save me and God can do something for me. I mean, that's, that's about as basic as it, as it has to be. When you call on anybody who calls on the name of the Lord, God help me, that statement is a statement of faith because you're saying in that statement, I believe that there's a God out there somewhere and I'm calling on him to help me because I don't have any other hope. Nothing else yet has been able to help me, but he might be able to. I'm going to try it. God, help me. So that's how it starts. Very simple. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue does not mean perfection. And it doesn't mean wearing clothes that are a certain length. Or hats that are, certain, or, you know, or hats or gloves or this or, you know, whole, not wearing makeup. I've heard all kinds of things growing up in church. Virtue means better behavior. It means to add moral behavior. And when you talk about morals, people get different, different versions. But morals are, are, are at the very base very simple. That's where the Ten Commandments started off. Don't kill, don't steal, don't envy, don't rob from people. You know, that's moral behavior. The morals of society. It's not the morals of church or the holiness of people that tell you that you have to act this certain way and be this certain, certain way. It means improvement in your behavior. Included in virtue is, is the word courage. Courage and the courage to change the things you can. For those of you who, who have heard that somewhere before in a prayer, and the courage to make changes and to face things about yourself and in your life. Let's keep going. So then you add to virtue knowledge. That means you start learning some new things. And to knowledge, temperance. Does anybody know what temperance is? Self-control. And people say self-control, meaning that I have to have a throttle on my behavior or I have to have a throttle on, my, on myself like a governor on a car engine so I don't overdo it. But that's not exactly what this is talking about. Self-control is having control and management over your own life and over your own future as God created you to have. People start off blaming or they, they, there's a, a thing called victimization or the victim mentality. And you listen to people talk and everything that happens in their life is somebody else's fault. It's somebody that did something to them or to one of their ancestors or to their group, people group or their whatever. And everything is somebody else's fault. And every part of their life is a result of something that somebody else did. And you know what that tells me when I hear people saying all that kind of thing is that they will accept no responsibility and no accountability for their own actions or their own behaviors or for what they have in their life. I don't do, victim mentality means that you have no control over yourself or your future. That's what victim means. So every time you stand around and you talk about what somebody else did to you or what somebody else did a thousand years ago in history or this or that, you are completely laying aside what it is that you could have been doing for yourself for your entire life. Because you are the one that has the, the, the ability, the God-given ability to change circumstances and to change things in your own life. Because God made you that way. So as you start to get this knowledge, this virtue, this faith, this belief, and all this other stuff, then you can start taking control of your own life. 
and you could say, I can make my life better or I can make it worse by my own choices and by my own decisions. And if somebody else does something to me, I can make better decisions to get myself out of it, to improve my circumstances and to do things better. I don't have to be stuck in the place where you've labeled me, where you've stereotyped me or where you want me to be for the rest of my life process of spiritual growth. Reference points. This is God's reference point, by the way. It's different from the way that people have talked to you your whole life, maybe. So you add to knowledge self-control and to self-control patience because all of these changes and all of these things, they don't happen overnight. Not for yourself, because you're going to make mistakes, I'm going to make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes, nobody is perfect. So you have to have patience. Let patience have its perfect work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take time over and over and over and over again until you get it right and you move on to the next step. You had patience, and then from patience, godliness understanding of God, relationship with God. You see how far down the list godliness is? Some people want to put godliness before faith. But this is Peter, the rock on which the church was built, the one that cussed everybody out and left Jesus hanging and denied him the night before he was crucified. This is, and godliness is almost at the end of his list. You don't have to start off meeting a definition of godliness because God, this is God's definition of godliness. You have accepted him and he has made you new on the inside from the minute that happened. That's God's definition of godliness. But then you find out that God, what God wants from what I was just talking about with the self-control and the temperance, as you start making better choices, you start doing better things for yourself, you find out that those are the ways that God wanted you to behave from, from the beginning. And you can cause yourself a lot less trouble, cost yourself a lot less time and get a lot more accomplished if you cut certain things out of your life and act more in the way that God wants you to behave if you become more godly. Make sure that you're going with God's reference point for godliness because man has a whole different reference point for godliness. Jesus was rebuking all of, all of the religious church people when he was preaching because he said, you've forgotten what really counts and what really matters. You're worried about whether somebody's washing their hands right before, at, before and after they eat their fried chicken and you've forgotten the more important points of the law, which are grace, mercy, and good judgment. And righteousness. You've forgotten about all that stuff, and you're worried about washing your hands before you eat. And how, so and, and how soon you wash your dishes after you eat. And how long the sleeves and the, and the hemline are on the skirt, on the dress you're wearing. God doesn't care about those things. God cares about what's on the inside. And this is the way that he sees you. Add to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. This kind of charity is called unconditional love. Love without strings attached. People say, Oh, you come to church. Oh, you're not walking in love. You're not behaving like love. You're not being a real Christian. Remember, we're, we're talking about changing our reference point for being a natural man. But notice, that's at the end of Peter's list. Because people always talk about, oh, my good intentions. Oh, my good heart. God knows my heart. God knows this and God knows that. And a lot of times when you hear some, oh, God knows my heart. That's an excuse for somebody that's been behaving badly, and they know it. Unconditional love means love without strings attached. 
love no matter what. That's the way that God loves us. But most people, they, we, can, we strive to get there. <coughs> it's not a place that you can start from. Because the more life experience you have, the more you realize how hard that actually is. To love somebody no matter how they're behaving. To love them no matter what it is that they do. It doesn't mean that you let them keep abusing you, mistreating you, or anything like that. But God still loves people no matter what it is that they do. And he always is ready to give them another chance if they want it. That's not an easy thing to do. That's why God, God does it. And, you know, but we're supposed to strive and work toward that direction. But it's not a place that we start off. I teach all the time about the two commandments. Jesus said the two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But in order for you to be able to love your neighbor, you also have to be able to love yourself. Part of what we're talking about here is changing your reference points is that you have to be able to see the ability in yourself for change, the ability to be different. You have to accept responsibility and be accountable for your own actions. And you have to be honest enough with yourself and with others to be able to say, I blew it and I messed up and I have to try. I want to try again and I'm going to do something different this time. I'm going to keep trying because it's worth it to me to make this change in my life. And I want to be able to give others the opportunity to improve and change their lives, to grow out from under the labels or the stereotypes that society has placed on them or that maybe I placed on them at some point or the labels that I placed on myself at some point. I don't intend to die being the same person that I am today. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to learn something different. I'm going to improve anything as much as I can. Just like I did from childhood, from infancy. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I got to hurry up. It's 12 o'clock. I had 10 minutes less this, this service, I think. But it's just coming out different, you know, it just happens. So, But Pastor, he's going to wrap, wrap up this series next week. I'm leaving holes here and there on purpose. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. So how, how do we make these changes? Where, where is a place to start? You have to start off working to change your point of reference, your reference point. Work to learn to see yourself the way that God sees you. The way that he sees you is new. Blank canvas. Not losing the knowledge or the understanding or the life experience that you gained prior to this point, but learning to apply it in a new way. Learning to see yourself in a new way, in a way that others may never have seen you, talked about you, or thought about you in your entire life. You need to learn how to see yourself as God sees you. So how do we do that? 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this means that we, this is it's an analogy of us looking into the mirror. And instead of seeing wrinkles and old age and spots and pimples and zits or seeing the loser that people call you or the liar that you've been accused of being and sometimes maybe are uh, or being the jerk or being tall, skinny, fat, short, or anything else that somebody has called you, instead of seeing those things, you start looking in the mirror and you start seeing the new you that's on the inside. You start seeing 
the you that God sees. And as the more that you look at that new person and the more that you work on changing these things that we read from, the, from Peter, from that process of spiritual growth, you begin to see the development in yourself. And as you begin to do that, you can begin to see it in others and recognize when they are changing things, when they are improving things, and give them the allowance to be the same human being that is on a path of progress the same way that you are. This path of spiritual growth especially for Christians. But as you continue to look into this mirror and seeing yourself the way that God sees you and calling yourself the names that God calls you and reminding yourself of the promises that God has made to you, just like he's made to everybody else that's sitting in this room that calls himself a Christian, you start gaining that knowledge and the grace and peace of God begins to be multiplied unto you and some of that worry and some of that anxiety and some of that self-loathing and self-doubt and self-hatred starts to melt off of you and you begin to see, have more love for yourself the way that God has unconditional love for you. And as that process happens, it enables you to start having love, more love, for your fellow man. Because the love that we just talked about, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. That love that you have for yourself is equal or directly proportional to the love that you can have for somebody else. So you have to be able to see yourself from God's perspective for this process to happen. And hopefully next week we're going to hear more about how we more about how we can start seeing those things in ourselves everybody stand up please so maybe you've been labeled stereotyped abused by others most of your life, you've been judged or considered to be a certain way with or without justification. Because sometimes people's judgments or views or other are well justified. Other times they're not. But remaining under a label or a stereotype leaves no room for future change. And everybody, until you stop breathing, needs, has the right and the ability to change things for themselves, to change their world. And not everybody's going to accept it. Some people will never accept you as being different from the label that they put on you because they never accept themselves as being different because other people in their life say, that's just the way you are and you're going to be that way until you die. But God doesn't say that. God says that you always have the ability to recover. You always have the ability to try something new. You always have the ability to learn and to grow. That's how we're able to be forgiven for messing up over and over and over again because God is always willing to give us another chance so let's pray and then we'll get out of here for, for today and come back again soon so pray with me thank you Lord for your grace and your mercy that has been applied to us and that you have given to us Thank you for giving us unconditional love and the ability and the freedom to grow continually and to always change and to never be stuck with a label or a stereotype. Thank you for seeing us as new people. Even when we mess up, when we repent, 
you forgive us and we get a do-over. Thank you for helping us change our reference points and our views of ourselves so that we can see, give others the same opportunity and see the changes that they are trying to make for themselves. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your continued compassion for every day of our life. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.